Sony executives never imagined that a film comedy could set off an international firestorm. But when one of its new releases mocked a humorous dictator, the company soon found itself under siege by a cyber army. The North Koreans were destroying the information and breaking the computers. Where does corporate responsibility end when the attacker is another country? It's got to be a terrible, terrible sinking feeling to see your company melting around you. Born as a small telecom firm in post-war Japan, by 2014, the Sony Corporation had outgrown its original mission and become a multinational conglomerate. They had music, they've got movies, they had gaming divisions, and of course, on top of that, the main electronics business. Though its parent company was Japanese, its film and television arm, Sony Pictures, was headquartered in Hollywood. When you look at a big corporation like Sony, homed in Japan, but a very global brand and a very global company, with an American-based film production picture company, they needed to be digital. That created risk. Sony's giant video game division had wrestled with hackers in the past. In 2011, Sony declared what it called a war on hackers, taking legal action to punish known software pirates. Sony had tried loading basically malicious software on people's computers to make sure that they wouldn't pirate games or music. Sony's aggressive anti-piracy campaigns earned it ire and ridicule in hacking circles. Hackers and the privacy community loved to hate Sony. So they were pretty routinely targeted because they just weren't seen as a company that was playing nice in this space. In retaliation, Hackers breached various Sony companies more than 20 times in 2011 alone. Yet Sony Pictures remained more concerned with financial losses than cyber threats. After a series of bad bets at the box office, Sony Pictures relied on the draw of major stars such as Seth Rogen to keep them afloat. So Seth Rogen, especially in 2014, was having a lot of really successful movies. Sony Motion Pictures considered them one of their, one of their really strong resources and were willing to green light just about any program that he was on. Seth Rogen was known for starring in raunchy comedies like Superbad and Knocked Up, but his latest project pushed the envelope even further. Rogen's comedic target this time was Kim Jong-un. The next movie, called The Interview, was about killing the current North Korean leader. Kim Jong-un was a North Korean dictator who had a strong distaste for the West and a formidable nuclear stockpile. Despite Kim's famous volatility, Sony's studio chief, Amy Pascal, had faith in Rogan and supported the film project. They said, great, we're excited to work on this project, and they saw it um, not just a fart movie, which it kind of was, but they thought that by assassinating a, an actual sitting world leader in film, that it would come across as thoughtful or edgy. The film put Sony Pictures in the crosshairs of a cyber threat far better equipped and more dangerous than the hackers its sister companies had sparred with in the past. When the trailer for the interview came out, North Korea immediately reacted in saying, this is unacceptable. You can't trivialize killing our leader. I mean, imagine how the United States would respond if China or Russia made a movie about killing an American president, Obama, Trump, or, or Biden. You know, we would rightfully be, be angry about that. Now, unfortunately, North Korea didn't just calmly say that's unacceptable like I am now. They came out in typical North Korea way of saying, this is crazy, this is terrorism, and there will be fiery death upon you if you don't do this, which maybe made it easier for Sony and the rest to say, well, this is just North Korea adding hyperbole here, and they never really mean it. The notion that its decisions about release of motion pictures might generate a cyber attack and it would then become the target of a nation state because of content that they generated. This was not a part of corporate calculations in terms of risk management going into 2014. It was easy to dismiss the over-the-top threats of the North Koreans, but the nation's cyber warfare capacities were very real. But however unlikely an attack by the North Koreans may have seemed, Sony did not entirely ignore the risk. Sony did 
do some due diligence, right? They talk to the Assistant Secretary of East Asia Affairs at the State Department. They talk to experts at RAND and other places. And some of those that responded did say, yes, you should be concerned about a cyber attack. Not everyone did, but there was some warning. And it does not appear that Sony took any extra steps to improve their cybersecurity at all. What they did was try and make the movie less insulting by editing the death scene of Kim Jong-un so it wasn't quite as gory. Eventually, the North Koreans struck. The attack began with a common and simple tactic known as spear phishing. Almost any company can fall victim to phishing. Phishing is having an email that appears to come from someone you know, that comes in, you click on a link, and that starts to give the adversaries, in this case the North Koreans, their initial foothold in your systems. But it doesn't end there. You get in and then you spread out as far as you can to gain access to more systems and more information. What the North Koreans did next was to then get the system administrator passwords. So now they have much more privilege on the system and access to all the emails. Yet while experts concede that companies as large as Sony may not be able to keep hackers outside their network forever, they say it's essential to detect intrusions as soon as possible. You want to detect it within the first couple of minutes, certainly within the first hour of when they get that access, and then try and start kicking them out within about an hour or so. Because once they're in and they start spreading around, that's when the real damage happens. Unfortunately, Sony remained unaware of the breach. Sony had no idea that the North Koreans were in their systems. For months, being patient, slowly taking these files and sending them outside of Sony's corporate network, um, bits at a time so they didn't get detected. After patiently abiding their time in the shadows, the attackers finally struck. For Sony employees, it was total chaos. They came in one morning and the systems were down and crashing around them. So what Sony would have to do is try and start solving the mystery of exactly what has gone wrong. Is this a computer failure? Did we try and update some software that we hadn't tested well enough, <laughs> right? Was this us? Sony's IT department was helpless after the attackers wiped out half the company's global network. More than 3,000 personal computers and 1,500 servers were wiped of every last bit of data before they went permanently dead. They're having difficulty because so many of the computers that they needed to try and figure out what was happening were no longer working themselves. The attackers' methods were not especially sophisticated. Experts take this as a sign that Sony had left its gates wide open. There were a lot of things that Sony ought to have done, and moreover, should have known needed doing. They might have used two-factor authentication. They had emails, they had personal information on employees that was just sitting around unencrypted. It's not best practice, that's standard practice, even in 2014, that you should keep those encrypted. But destruction of data and computers was not the attacker's only aim. In the weeks to come, the hackers dumped scripts, unreleased films, embarrassing emails, and 47,000 social security numbers onto the open internet. The emails became a particular source of humiliation for the Sony leadership, bringing to light corporate infighting, celebrity ridicule, and even a spying campaign targeting employee emails. What happened at Sony was more about what was said in the emails that were released online by the North Koreans. And so Amy Pascal, who is the studio chief, did not get her contract renewed because embarrassing things were discovered in her emails. The North Koreans weren't trying to monetize that data. They were using it to embarrass the company. They were using it to destroy um, the databases inside. They were uh, using it to coerce Sony to not release the movie The Interview. Despite the clear message of the attack, studio executives still hoped to recoup their losses by releasing the film. However, the issue had become an international conflict involving nation states. Sony soon found itself caught between frightened business partners and a territorial U.S. government. The North Koreans said, if this is shown in movie theaters, there will be a bloodbath. And so many of the large cinema chains said, we can't deal with that kind of threat. We're not going to show this. You had a foreign nation state making threats about the First Amendment and who can say what in the United States. President Obama did a major public news conference. First, he was very clear that this attack was by the North Koreans. 
and there was no way he would have ever had to do that press conference, I think, if Sony would have committed to releasing the movie. Today, the attack on Sony stands out as a landmark case in the history of cybersecurity. We've now got to the point where on almost any board, you've got at least one board director that's been through a serious cybersecurity incident. The Sony case was one of those events that really made it clear that companies had to defend themselves against cyber events that were geopolitically motivated in addition to just protecting their intellectual property. This isn't just something that you outsource to the IT department. No, this is central to the future of the company as a whole.